Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lecture today. This is going to be pitfalls and perils in OD eye care referrals. I'm going to be talking to you about a few different topics today that hopefully you'll be able to bring back to practice and help you with your patient care, as well as your selection of who you refer your patients to. So let's talk a little bit about this talk. Obviously, we are doing a sponsored talk by Glaucos, and the product we're speaking of is Fotrexa viscous and Fotrexa along with the cross-linking iLink system. So the inserts are important. We're going to get into why the FDA is so important. And hopefully you'll gain some improvement in terms of how you uh, assign patients for their care. My disclosures are that I do speak for Glaucos and I'm an advisory board member for Guardian Health Sciences. My education is, of course, I am a practicing optometrist, uh, practice out of Pennsylvania College of Optometry. I did my residency in eye disease at Baltimore VA and rotated at Johns Hopkins. Uh, but germane to this lecture, I do have a Master of Jurisprudence from Loyola University in Chicago School of Law, and hopefully I can bring some of those tips to you. The purpose of our presentation is to look at the considerations when making eye care referrals, and those are medical um, considerations as well as medical legal. The obvious uh, importance of FDA-approved drugs is going to become very clear as we go forward, and those uh, devices that we utilize every day for our patients go through a very arduous process. Because there's some legal talk in here, I always want to put a disclaimer aside that this is for informational purposes only. It's not to be construed as professional legal advice. If you do have something going on in your world, definitely consult an attorney uh, for any matters that you have. So as you know, we as a profession uh, have many uh, legal considerations in patient care. Uh, how we speak, the ethical, moral, and legal considerations are boundless. Our exam room decorum, uh, the testing or procedure selections we make, how we document, and of course referrals, which this lecture is all about, uh, is really a conscious choice that has legal implications every step of the way. Now, the relationship you have with your patient is technically a legal contract, so we are under no obligation to engage in practice or accept professional employment. And the relationship is a consensual one. The patient is seeking our care, and we as a physician knowingly accept the patient. It's also important to know that some situations are one where remuneration is not need to be financial for the contract to be legal. Once we start this relationship though, legal protections are afforded particularly to the patient under contract law. And that includes how we end relationships with patients uh, if we're treating them for a condition that is ongoing. Uh, if you sever a patient tie, perhaps they're being uh, difficult with your staff or not following your decisions as a provider, you can't simply just send them out of the office. You need to find other uh, accommodations for them with another provider. Uh, otherwise, you could end up with abandonment charges, uh, which have their own legal ramifications for us. So assuming you uh, agree to contract, so to speak, with your patient to provide care, we wanna know what legal issues are of most concern. And of course, the big one that we all think about, the reason we get medical malpractice insurance is negligence. And that has civil and regulatory implications. If we're not practicing to the standard of care, there are implications for us both financially as well as potentially uh, removal or loss of our license. So we as a profession have changed quite a bit. If you look at optometric malpractice in 1941, we were basically a glasses prescription uh, profession. And you see in this case here in Georgia in 1941, Con V. Shaw, that the provider basically suffered uh, headaches, uh, excuse me, the, the plaintiff suffered headaches and nausea, and uh, for lack of a better term, was backward in his schoolwork. And so we see that the optometrist uh, was found to not exercise reasonable care and skill in how they examine the eye and the fitting of the glasses. And the award for this patient was $75. So you can see that that is um, very nominal compared to what we might face today. In 2022, we are a very different profession. We are among the leading provider of primary eye care services nationally with 32,000 FTE equivalent ODs participating around the country. Importantly, in about 4,300 communities, uh, optometrists are the only source of primary eye care. And so that means that they're going to not only deal with the conditions of old, which are nearsightedness and prescribing glasses or contact lenses, 
But now we manage and diagnose conditions such as keratoconus, glaucoma, retinal disease, and more. And of course, we can treat them with medications and procedures, but sometimes we do have to refer patients out to specialized surgeons for surgical care. In 2022, the type of malpractice you might encounter would be very different. Many of us have had this situation where a plaintiff or our patient in that case before the lawsuit caused reporting flashes and floaters on a weekend. And unfortunately, this provider said, hey, come in tomorrow, we'll check it out then. Unfortunately, by the next day, the macula became detached because of the retinal detachment. And unfortunately, there was permanent and vision uh, loss in, in one of the patient's eyes. And for that type of error, you see a $2.5 million award to plaintiff. Well, there are some of us who have three and six million dollar plans. Some of us have one and three. Uh, depends on how much you uh, take in malpractice insurance. But this is a very significant uh, day at the office, so to speak. Now, when it comes to malpractice, there are certain um, kind of sub examples that are included. One is injury during and immediate to any eye procedure. So uh, perhaps you're putting in a punctal plug and do it improperly. Uh, certainly, we worry about incorrect treatments or mismanaging. Uh, an example there might be giving someone an oral prednisone uh, after they've had a diagnosis of optic neuritis. We know that that should be injection. And then finally, the big one for us as providers is failing to diagnose the condition or illness. And that's something that comes along, unfortunately, uh, with some of the silent conditions like glaucoma and keratoconus, which is what we'll be speaking about here today a lot. The other part is that these standards are always evolving. So what used to be okay uh, in the past would now be outside the standard of care. Uh, we see this as technology has advanced, as treatments have advanced. And so we wanna keep current with the latest knowledge. You're gonna go to CE events, you'll go to webinars and do different things to kind of keep current because these standards do change and the treatment protocols do change with them. We look at a case in 2008 versus maybe how we would handle it today. We have this young patient coming in, he's 21 years old, Caucasian male, basically has itchy eyes. He's got some decreased quality of vision starting in the left eye, doesn't like his glasses and, and just having some difficulty with night driving. He's healthy, we see no allergies, no medications are needed. Vision looks okay in the right eye, 2020 vision gets all the way down to 2015. Left eye, not quite as good, 2025 minus, pinhole doesn't seem to help a little bit there. And so when we do our refraction, we see some astigmatism, fair amount of uh, myopia starting, and uh, vision just not getting you know great on that left eye. We do our traditional slit lamp exam, dilated fundus exam, and what we find here is that there is some papillae in the, in the lids, and that can obviously give us some of our itching symptoms. We obviously see that there's some cupping there with a 0.65 uh, cup to disc ratio in each eye, so that has to be investigated. But generally, the retina looks flat and intact, and we don't see any issues with holes or tears. So, do we just say, hey, allergic conjunctivitis, some mild amblyopia in that left eye because of all the astigmatism, and uh, just give them a glasses prescription and some over-the-counter uh, olipatidine for allergy? Hopefully you're saying no and considering doing some additional testing here. And so what we think about here is that when we have mild amblyopia or amblyopia, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. And you really wanna make sure you're doing your due diligence to make sure nothing else is going on. But we look at this patient's optic nerve, we see that even though the cupping is quite large, the nerve too uh, has very healthy retinal nerve fiber layer. And so not too concerned about glaucoma in this young patient, but certainly wanted to do an investigation because of this nerve cupping. We do a macular scan and we see maculas that look pretty darn good, very healthy thickness, nice foveal depression. So now we're kind of satisfied with the back of the eye. We move forward and do a scan of the cornea. We have one eye here on the right. This is the left. And generally speaking, we have all the data we need and are we satisfied now? Well, I think that if you are, you have some considerations that you may have missed. So we need an explanation for the reduced vision. 
And an amblyope typically is not going to have a decrease in quality of vision. And so that is your clue to the diagnosis, is that things just don't seem to be well when in the past they were not having difficulties. And obviously we have some side issues with night driving. So what additional testing would you do? So we'll move to this more advanced uh, technology called the Scheinflu uh, technology, which is brought to us by Penicam. And as you see here, we get a couple different things. Our patient has um, what you've been hopefully noticing in other lectures as a skew deviation in their topography map. And what happens with a Penicam is that you not only get the sagittal curve uh, topography front, but you also get four additional scans that give us information called the float. And the float tells us the deviation from normal for patients. So we're gonna go through that a little bit and understand why it's important and how it can detect a condition earlier. We also have a corneal thickness map, which is our pachymetry. And as you'll see, particular to this patient and others who have early keratoconus, the thinnest part is now below the ap apical uh, center. So we have sort of guidelines for us. Anything more than five uh, in the anterior float and anything more than 12 in the posterior float um, are conditions that need to be really paid attention to. So you see in our patient here, their anterior float is about 13 at its peak, which is far above the five. And you see the posterior float is around 21, which is far exceeding the 12. As you follow this patient over time, you can see what typically becomes our uh, pellucid style of topography that wasn't evident in 2008. And then as you get to 2011, it's progressing uh, quite significantly. Along the way, we're able to see not only does the topography change, but so too does the Penicam, where now you have floats of 24 and 44, and pachymetry that is steepening more so inferiorly. You can see it's getting worse as the patient's condition is getting more evident and obvious to us. Unfortunately for this patient back in those days, uh, we will see that the progression resulted in scarring and for this patient to regain vision would require a corneal transplant. So we say would this observation only in, in sort of gas permeable or scleral lenses management serve as an acceptable standard of care today? And quite frankly, you know now that no, this is not a good standard of care. Uh, delaying treatment these days when we have a treatment like Fotrexa and eye link cross-linking um, would be able to prevent some of that vision loss. So this would be a likely uh, successful malpractice claim against us as the provider. We see that there's already a case pending litigation going on. Uh, unfortunately, the patient you know, was diagnosed with keratoconus and, and our colleague optometrist uh, failed to order topography maps, did not refer the patient for cross-linking, uh, even though progression was evident uh, managing keratoconus with FDA-approved treatments is the standard of care in 2022. Mistakes for mistakes get even higher. We've seen that there was a surgeon uh, in New York basically found negligence for not detecting form for us keratoconus preoperatively, uh, did essentially a LASIK procedure on the patient, and the award was over $7.25 million. The standard evolve continues to evolve. We know today that the AAO corneal ectasia preferred practice pattern recommends prompt referral of patients uh, who are diagnosed with cross-linking that is progressive uh, to an FDA approved provider. We see that even during the process where um, COVID kind of delayed our patients getting to uh, providers that three months period cost them um, a line of vision. So time really is not on our side when it comes to this condition and patients do need to get there promptly to prevent vision loss. The cross-linking procedures that is the gold standard is the Dresden protocol, which is epi off at the moment. So you've made the diagnosis properly. Perhaps you've been able to access some of the techniques that you've learned. And now it's time to refer the patients for procedures and surgeries. And there are civil, regulatory, and even criminal implications for how we do our referrals. One of the things to consider is to who are you sending your patient for specialized care? The other is what liability do you have for the external care rendered? 
And then finally, where am I vulnerable when providing co-management services? And all three of these are very important as we move forward. So, you know, we have our ophthalmologists in our community. Their competency is typically looked around upon by their credentials and their reputation. But we really don't know significantly or really distinctly what their OR reputation is, the way maybe the nurses who work with them week in, out, week in and week out do. The other part is, you know, how can we as optometrists really know if they're holding on to those patients who have some difficulties and we really don't see the negative outcomes? The other protect thing we want to know is, are they providers that are performing unapproved procedures? And by that, we mean utilizing non-FDA approved drugs or devices. We see this happen in collagen cross-linking where people are compounding their own riboflavin and using devices other than the FDA approved iLink system. So approval is important and it's also required by law. FDA approved goes through conduction of careful evaluation. It looks at the benefits and risks. And of course the decision is done by a strong scientific community you're looking at approval for basically labeling how to use the drug, what dosage to use it, and for how long. There are people who use FDA-approved instruments off-label, meaning they're using it for something that maybe wasn't the initial intended condition uh, or given in a different way or a different dose. And that starts to carry some risk because now you're stepping into an area where perhaps there hasn't been quite as much um, review over what your provider is using it for. And then lastly, of course, is the worst, which is an unapproved uh, provider uh, example of doing things that are basically not tested by the FDA, not randomized, uh, simply not really gone through the rigorous process. And so it's not determined to be safe or effective. And there's no labeling which can help us to avoid serious side effects for our patients. What liability do you have for the carrier rendered? So. We as optometrists have been named as co-defendants involving surgical cases that are performed by ophthalmologists throughout the years. We see this in LASIK as well as in other procedures. But we wanna know if referring to providers that are doing unapproved procedures increases your risk of litigation. We see that providers who re basically referred this patient but are not performing co-management also have been named in lawsuits brought against surgeons. The question is, does it really matter if it's FDA approved or not? If you look at the screen right now, you might be wondering what it is you're looking at. And it's not very easy to determine. The reality is this is my dog rider. But the picture on the right was my view of my dog when I went through a serious keratoconus event uh, with an off-label procedure. So it really does matter to have FDA approval uh, because my unapproved procedure caused significant visual problems for me. In 2015, before FDA approved Fotrexa, I underwent cross-linking with both unsafe chemicals and unregulated equipment. And unfortunately, with basically two weeks of legal blindness, significant pain, I was really concerned as to whether or not I would get my vision back. I was strongly considering malpractice litigation against the surgeon, the co-managing OD, the compounding pharmacy, basically anyone involved in my care because the stakes were so high that I may not ever be able to practice again. I basically lost all the epithelium off both corneas. And this was me just, um, you know, about a week into trying to recover. You can see so much damage. Uh, basically, hand motion vision to count fingers, kind of vacillating back and forth for nearly two weeks. Um, I don't think you can appreciate this until you've gone through it, but not being able to see and not knowing if it's coming back is, is very scary. The pain was significant, um, really was using a lot of narcotics, really without relief. And as to I am today, you can see uh, you know, epithelial ingrowth now under the re-epithelialized cornea, um, you know, hopefully never flares up, but still kind of a remnant of what was left behind. When you look at my scans, you can see that yellow band in the posterior, excuse me, elevation in the front, uh, sort of demarcating all of the ingrowth. My cross-linking was uh, basically done according to protocols uh, that were just not challenged by the FDA at this point. 
And so the other part of it was that my light source was, you know, basically imported or smuggled in from Europe at the time. Uh, it was not FDA approved and basically um, really untested, unmonitored. The iLink system is FDA approved, and it's something that you can allow uh, the confidence to have your patients treated knowing that the machine is regulated and has been tested vigorously. Unfortunately, my riboflavin solution was compounded by an independent pharmacy. Uh, I, may have, I always joke that it may have well, just as well been done by some high school students. The problem is that they uh, compounded my uh, riboflavin with thimerosal instead of BAK. Uh, if you do equal solutions there, you're looking at a very dangerous thimerosal, which is typically a quarter of that solution concentration. And we see in studies that uh, the toxicity is about 95% at 0.01. So definitely part of the reason uh, my corneas were, were denuded of epithelium. So it really does matter to have FDA approved drugs and devices. You, know, you can take my word for it uh, firsthand. We know that we went through this, that unapproved is just, it's not determined to be safe and effective. And uh, you're really, you know, playing with the dangerous situation when you're using providers who are ordering riboflavin uh, and using old devices that aren't tested or, or calibrated. The trial for framework for cross-linking is very uh, arduous. Uh, the FDA determined that the uh, CDER, or the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, would be responsible in, in iLink as well as Votrexa. And the, the reason for that is that any drug company who wants to sell a drug has to test it first. The company sends all that evidence to the CDER, and they then will look at it with a team of scientists, statisticians, chemists, pharmacologists, really to look and make sure that the data is strong and that it's safe for our patients. And this is really going to prevent quackery, what we used to call quackery, uh, doctors and patients getting the information they need to use the medicines best. It also ensures that both brand name and generic work correctly and that their health benefits are going to outweigh the known risks. We see in cross-linking, the most important thing is we have 60,000 plus procedures performed. We have data on the epi validated controlled clinical trials. And most importantly is adverse events have to be reported. My events were never reported to anyone. There's no need to say this happened to Dr. Conley. It basically is just swept under the rug. We see you want to avoid the non-FDA approved systems. We don't know if it's calibrated. Can it even be serviced if it's from overseas? Is it the three milliwatt part of the Dresden protocol or is it 20 milliwatts? Does that matter? Is the energy steady? Is it fluctuating? And even is it at the right, right wavelength? We just don't know. So your co-management process really evolves around finding providers who are doing FDA approved procedures we know that co-management is an excellent opportunity for us to participate in the care of our patients. The transfer of that care is a responsibility for the patient to have great care between the surgeon and the referring provider. And when we see co-management is legitimate, it is recognized by CMS and OIG as perfectly legitimate when done appropriately. Unfortunately, we have to be concerned if a patient is getting an explicit assurance that the patient will be returned to you after surgery or procedure. We also have to be concerned about the co-management fees. Are they fair market value for the work we're doing? And are we in compliance with provisions of Stark, anti-kickback, and other state kickback statutes? We have a new problem that's basically come about because one of the issues that happens is where do we determine what that fair market value is? And one of the things that will be important is that if we have lawsuits that are coming forward, as we see here in the United States Odom case versus Southeast Eye Specialist, we have a whistleblower saying the ophthalmology practice engaged in kickback relationships with optometrists. And that, of course, is something that we have to be careful because if you're getting free continuing education or benefits or gifts, uh, these are definitely going to be put under the microscope during this uh, lawsuit and we will see where things shake out. As we go forward, we want to make sure the following. Fetrexa, viscous, and Fetrexa are the FDA-approved tested systems with the corneal cross-linking eye link system. 
The reason it's so important to have that FDA approval is because you can see even in this insert, we see that we know what the adverse reactions are going to be. The patient will receive some haze. They potentially are going to have some side effects like keratitis. They will have some dry eye. They might have some light sensitivity and pain. These are all expected. And so you know that when you're dealing with these patients, this is the guide map for how we should be treating them. We have FDA approval for a reason. It's a pivotal study that is done and it is approved by many scientists looking at that data. When we go off label, we certainly are using an FDA approved device, but now we're dealing with things that potentially are not designed for what the drug was uh, made for. And then anything that is non-FDA approved is basically imported illegal unapproved cross-linking devices, unapproved riboflavin, basically using a uh, drug or combo other than iLink is just unapproved. Unapproved and illegal cross-linking is something we certainly want to try to avoid. We have any riboflavin, riboflavin solution uh, using cross-linking is, is classified as a drug by the FDA. No other riboflavin solution other than Fotrexa viscous and Fotrexa have FDA approval as a drug, and that's important. There are providers who have tried to, under the guise of um, IRB and, and you know, talking about sponsored studies, uh, to be able to use unapproved systems. They have to go through a very uh, strict requirement by FDA for approved IND applications. So make sure if your provider is doing off-label work or unapproved work that they are uh, properly vested through the uh, FDA. We also have alerts that have been provided on these devices that have come in because they basically are not approved and they're illegal for importation and sale here in the U.S. And just remember, it's unlawful for a compounding pharmacy to make or sell a copy of the Glucose FDA approved riboflavin. So anything they're making is not going to be that formula. Make sure you're referring to providers performing treatments with iLink. We know that there's a system in place. The device is designed to be follow that Dresden protocol. And we know that Fetrexa viscous and Fetrexa are going to be used for our patients in these settings. One last thing I want to leave with you is that insurance inclusion and coverage has really come a long way. Uh, if your patient is going to a provider that's not doing FDA approved iLink, they're probably charging them out of pocket. And so unfortunately, that's not really uh, what we want for our patients when there is an approved system that's safe and effective and also has coverages through insurance. We also have to consider what our liability insurance carrier uh, would do in such cases if a patient is being sent to a place that is using non-approved uh, devices. And we see that anything that is commercial use of unapproved products include risks that they're not going to be covered by your liability insurance, which leaves you liable uh, financially. There are codes that allow us to use treatments for our patients that are FDA approved. It also is important to realize that there's no global period. So your patient's follow-up care that comes back to you is going to be billable. So that's important as far as uh, not really needing co-management fees when you're dealing with the fact that you can treat the patient properly in your office afterwards. You can always look and see who in your area is perform performing FDA-approved iLink. We have the iLinkExpert.com website that allows you to put in where you live and find those providers. I hope this has been very helpful for you and beneficial for how important FDA approval is. Obviously, my experience was uh, one that I like to share so that you know how significant a problem this can be. And I look forward to uh, working with you in the future if you have questions. You have a great day now. Thank you.